I've received lots of messages from people to read to you today. I won't be able to read all of them, but one of them is uh, another person who knows Julian well, and, and like many of us who know him well, feel en feels enormous affection and admiration uh, and concern for him. It's our, one of our national living treasures, Philip Adams. Um, Philip said that in a recent conversation on air, he asked John Pilger how an American justice system can accuse a non-American of treason against it. And John's response was, we're all Americans now. And Philip says, treason, it's we who are guilty of treason, treason against our principles, not Julian, the man in the iron cell. John Pilger has been holding power to account all over the world for decades. We are enormously grateful to him because he has stood by Julian from the very beginning and continues to. John Pilger. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. In a few hours' time, Julian will be roused in his cell. It'll be about five o'clock in the morning. Uh, the darkness that uh, will be outside will be lit by strips of unforgiving fluorescent lights. He may eat, or he may not. Since he's been in Belmarsh, he's lost between 10 and 15 kilos in weight. At nine o'clock this morning, he'll be led through a series of tunnels to Woolwich Court, which is next to Belmarsh. In fact, it's an extension of the prison. On the way, other prisoners will shout their encouragement Things like, go Julian. They respect him. And they know that today is the beginning of his David and Goliath struggle for justice. Belmarsh is not a Victorian prison. It was purpose built in the 90s to hold dangerous people. Terrorists, murderers, and journalists who tell the truth. But I'm serious. Ten years ago, someone in the Ministry of Defence in London leaked a top secret document which listed the enemies of the modern world and put the most dangerous enemies in three categories. Terrorists, Russian spies, and investigative journalists. Of the three categories, that is those who did their job <coughs> investigative journalists were declared threat number one. What they were saying was that journalists who broke the tight ranks of the so-called mainstream media and did their job, that is, they exposed warmongering and the lies of Imperial Britain, America, Australia, and all the other states that hide behind a democratic facade, are far more of a threat than terrorists and spies because they alert the public to power that operates above the law and often beyond reproach and in our name. If journalists had been doing their job, they would have already reported another report, and that was around the same time. A, an extensive study by the Pentagon described how they would destroy WikiLeaks and what a threat WikiLeaks was. And central to this study was that it would be a campaign of smear aimed at Julian. Well, they'd succeeded up to a point. Journalists, as they pointed out in this study, would be those who would carry the smear, and that's happened. It's happened in this country, 
in the newspapers, the Herald, the ABC, all of them. Up to now, up to now, suddenly they're discovering that they themselves may be at risk. WikiLeaks is threat number one because it has told us how illegal wars are fabricated, how governments are overthrown, how we are spied upon through our phones and screens. Julian's work has been an extraordinary public service, but above all, it's authentic journalism, in contrast to the counterfeit version that fills the pages of newspapers and TV screens that ingratiates itself with the low life of politics that has beaten the war drums of every criminal invasion in my lifetime from Vietnam to Iraq. Julian Assange is the diametric opposite. That's why he's in Belmarsh prison and why he's in the dock today literally fighting for his life. Belmarsh Prison is the future for real journalism. It's a sinister, forbidding place. A report by the Inspector of Prisons describes how violence is used to control and intimidate prisons and prisoners, and I've seen this in Belmarsh myself. In Julian's case, they've isolated him and used psychological torture read the extraordinary report by Niels Melser, the United Nations reporter on torture. Whenever I visit Julian in Belmarsh, it takes up to half an hour to go through the maze of body scans, the biometric tests, the hermetically sealed spaces, the electronic doors that often don't work. And when you think that's it, guards appear with dogs and the dogs slobber on your hands and sniff your backside. Finally, I catch sight of Julian sitting at the far end of a large room. He wears grey prison clothes and a yellow armband. <coughs> Excuse me, and a yellow armband. His greeting is always fulsome, one of pleasure and relief. <coughs> when I first visited Julian in Belmarsh, not long after he was dragged out of the Ecuadorian embassy, I was shocked by his appearance. His first words were, I think I'm losing my mind. He wasn't losing his mind, <clears throat> and it wasn't long before the bright, inquisitive, funny Julian Assange um, re-emerged. His resilience, I can tell you, is quite astonishing. But how long can this resilience be sustained? In my own work, I've found, often found myself in difficult, sometimes even life-threatening situations. But the worst, the most intractable, the most demoralizing, the most dehumanizing is in the categorized world in which Julian Assange <coughs> is trapped. I have seen it but frankly, I can't imagine it for myself. It's this psychological pressure that breaks people. The British government invented this modern form of torture in the liberation struggle in Malaya and in Northern Ireland. People who survive it are never quite the same again. If Julian is extradited to the US, a darkness awaits him. He'll be subjected to a prison regime <coughs> called Special Administrative Measures, or SAMS. He'll be placed in a cage in the bowels of a supermax prison, a hellhole. He'll be cut off from all contact with the rest of humanity. Belmarsh has given him a taste of this expression of pure fascism. So our responsibility today is clear. We must rescue Julian from this living death. But how? <coughs> In Australia, 
we have an opportunity that doesn't exist elsewhere. This is Julian's homeland, and the Government of Australia has a moral responsibility to rescue its citizens from the most notorious political persecution since Dreyfus. I can understand why many of you will react to this cynically. A government led by Scott Morrison doing the right thing, you say? Impossible. Well, that depends. All governments balance their actions against their reputations and their sense of survival in a changing world. Last week, to everyone's shock, Prime Minister Boris Johnson agreed with his archenemy, Jeremy Corbyn, when Corbyn raised the Assange case in Parliament. <clears throat> Johnson agreed that the extradition treaty between Britain and America was unbalanced and something had to be done. Moreover, Johnson didn't attack Julian. He even thanked Corbyn for raising his case. What does this mean? It means that a political deal is possible. It means that Johnson is wary of Trump, just as Europe is wary of Trump, just as Australia, the most obedient dog in the litter, ought to be wary of Trump and the rest of the gang in Washington. If Julian, if Julian dies in an American hellhole, Scott Morrison is in trouble. That's why this rally today must be a point of departure for a movement that confronts the Australian government with the dire consequences if it does not act to save Julian Assange and act now. <laughs> today, today Julian will face court proceedings perhaps like none other. The rituals will be observed the royal crest above the magistrate will be polished and prominent. But nowhere on earth is there a more politically tainted hearing, overseen by a judge who has already allowed a group of Americans seated behind the lawyers to effectively direct the prosecution. I have sat in her court and seen this charade for myself. It shames anything that might be called British justice. And remember that the extradition treaty between the United States and Britain specifically says that if the offence is in any way political, it must be thrown out and the defendant freed. 17 of the 18 American charges against Julian are made under the 1917 Espionage Act that was intended, intended to be political. When these proceedings are finally over, perhaps in June, and before there is an appeal, the British government has the power to free Julian. It's at this point that the Australian government can exercise its diplomatic power and claim back its citizen. But this will only happen. This will only happen if your numbers here today turn into thousands, and into tens of thousands, and into hundreds of thousands, and if more MPs like Andrew Wilkie and George Christensen stand up. In other words, if the pressure is relentless, day after day, week after week. Remember, all governments fear their people's true opposition. I used to doubt that a movement for Julian could ever build in Britain, but I was wrong. And it's now well underway, and Julian's case is fast becoming a national issue of sovereignty. Is Australia prepared to stand up for its sovereignty too? I'm conscious that this rally is being held in a place where on the 25th of April we commemorate those who fell in terrible, mostly unnecessary wars. The fallen are our sovereign heroes and many were indeed heroic and courageous. But there's another kind of courage which is rare in my experience. It's the courage of those who speak the truth and speak up for the truth, who dissent, who stand up to the powerful. These are our unsung heroes. Today, as he is led into court, 
Julian Assange is both our collective conscience and a true Australian hero. I'd like, I'd like, to, end, I'd like to end with this. If something should happen to Julian, if he falls terribly ill and is stricken or even dies, those who'll have his blood on their hands will be those who have hunted him, who have defamed him and assassinated his character and who, day, and who today remained cravenly silent. We know who they are. Former Prime Minister Julian, Julia Gillard, who wanted to strip Assange of his citizenship and who forced him to seek political asylum. And former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, who had the chance to rescue Julian, but lacked the wits and the guts to carry it through. And those in the media, the counterfeit journalists, who perpetuated lies that he'd been charged with a crime or Sweden, or was being manipulated by Moscow. Decency and history will not forgive and forget them. Thank you for your support today. Please build it into a proud movement and bring him home.